Well, tonight, the message, the title tonight is simply Thy Kingdom Come. Thy Kingdom Come. And I'd like us to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to read a few verses from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul wrote 2 Corinthians during his third missionary journey. It was written in Macedonia. If you dig a little deeper, you'll find it was written in Macedonia in 57 AD, in the autumn of 57 AD. Now, Paul had been to Corinth originally in 52 AD, and that's when the church started. And you can read all about that. This was in a second missionary journey. When you can read about it in Acts chapter 18. It tells you all the details of how he'd gone to Corinth. He'd stayed with Aquila and Priscilla, who were tent makers like he was, and how it was really difficult to get established. In fact, he shook out his clothes at one stage, but he persevered and it took off. So in the meantime, in the interim, we've come to 57 AD. And sadly, people, some people had risen up who were hostile to Paul and they were trying to throw mud at him and they were doubting his apostleship and they were doubting his manner of life. And so the cause of this letter emerged. This is why he had to write this letter. It was to vindicate his apostleship and his manner of living. And you'll find, if you read through all of 2 Corinthians, it's the most biographical, the most personal of all of Paul's letters. You really get to know him in it. But tonight we're just going to take a snippet from it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we're reading from verses 17 through to verse 21. Verse 17 through to verse 21. And I'm going to zoom into one verse in particular tonight. I'll tell you that after the reading. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. All these things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ Jesus and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation or the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 20, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who had no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Well, tonight we're going to zoom into verse 20 in particular. Verse 20. I'm reading it in the Amplified Bible this time. It says, we are Christ's ambassadors, God making his appeal, as it were, through us. We, as Christ's personal representatives, beg you for his sake to lay hold of the divine favour offered you and be reconciled to God. And another translation says, we are now Christ's ambassadors, as though God were appealing direct to you through us. As his personal representatives, we say, make your peace with God. Make your peace with God. So we, or you, are Christ's ambassadors. In fact, Paul used this term ambassador in another occasion. It was in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 20. He talked about being an ambassador in chains. He said, pray for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I may fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. So we have to ask tonight, what is an ambassador? 
Now we know if we watch the news that there are ambassadors throughout the world, there's ambassadors from this country serving in different countries throughout the world representing this country. So we know vaguely what the term is about. But what are the characteristics of an ambassador? And we find if we look at what an ambassador is in the world and compare it to this, we see a lot of similarities. So that's what we're going to do tonight. What is an ambassador? Well, first of all, an ambassador is a person who represents one country while living in another country. An ambassador is somebody who represents one country while living in another country. So they represent their home country living on foreign soil. Do you remember when Paul was talking to the people, the believers in the church in Philippi? He said in chapter 3, verse 20, he says, For we are, for, for our citizenship is in heaven. He says, Our citizenship is in heaven. And I'm going to read this verse in its context tonight uh, in J.B. Phillips' translation. It's a more modern translation, but I loved the words when I read them this week. If you read the verse before, this is what it says. It says, there are many of whom I told you before and tell you even now again with tears that are enemies of the cross of Christ. These men are heading for utter destruction. Their God is their own appetite. Their pride is not what they should be ashamed of. And this world is the limit of their horizon. This world is the limit of the horizon. But we are citizens of heaven. Our outlook goes beyond this world to the hopeful expectation of the Saviour who will come from heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, our citizenship is in heaven. <coughs> That's what Paul says. Our citizenship is in heaven. He didn't say it will be in heaven one day. He says, it is, present reality, it is in heaven. We are already citizens of heaven through our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Many are living as enemies of the cross of Christ and this world is a horizon. But our citizenship goes beyond this world for it's in heaven. It tells us in the Bible that he's rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and he's transferred, he has transferred us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. So it's not a future promise, it's now, if we are believers in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus said, there's only one way to get into heaven, he said, I'm the way. And he said to Nicodemus, he said when Nicodemus had questioned him, he says, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. And those words born again literally mean born from above. Born from above. So when we're born from above, we become citizens of heaven. And that's what we are tonight. We are citizens of heaven. But while we're citizens of heaven, we're still residents on earth. Residents on earth. So I wonder, do you see yourself tonight as a citizen of heaven? And are we living as citizens of heaven on earth? You see, Paul, Peter, he talked a bit about this. He said, you should conduct yourselves with true reverence throughout the time of your temporary residence on the earth, whether long or short. This is our temporary residence. Re residence. And we should conduct ourselves with true reverence. And again, he said in another letter, he said, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens or pilgrims, in another translation, aliens and strangers in the world, to abstain from the sinful desires that war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. But sadly, some drive their stakes too deeply on earthly soil. They get too attached to this world. And that's why John, in his letter, he had to say, for all that's in this world, the lust of the flesh, craving for sensual gratification, the lust of the eyes, that's greedy longings of the mind, and the pride of life, 
which is assurance in one's own resources and in the stability of earthly things. These do not come from the Father, but from the world. <clears throat> and the world passes away and disappears, and with it the forbidden cravings. But he who does the will of God and carries out his purposes in his life abides forever. And remember Paul when he was talking to the uh, Colossians in chapter 3 and verse 1, he started it by telling us to set our minds and our hearts on things that are above, have a heavenly mindset. He says, since you've been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden in Christ with God. The Amplified says, set your minds and keep them set on the things that are above, the higher things. So we're citizens of heaven and still residents of earth. I was thinking of that song, we may sing it later, we sang it a few weeks ago, where it says, let none of the things of the world ever sway me. I'll run till I finish the race. We can't allow the things of the world to sway us <clears throat> because we're citizens of heaven and we have a responsibility here on earth. So just like an ambassador who represents his home country on foreign soil, that's us. We represent our home country on this foreign soil as pilgrims on the earth. But let's take it a step further. What else about an ambassador? An ambassador is an authorised representative of a sovereign. Isn't that right? He's an authorised representative of the sovereign. For example, the role of the UK ambassador is to function as a channel of communication between the British government and that of the host nation. To act simply as an official representative of the UK and all of the affairs. He simply transmits everything from the home country. And his job is to promote the interests of the UK on the foreign soil. Now that's a heavy responsibility and that's a high calling. But you know we also have a high calling and we have a holy calling. And if you look at our passage tonight it says we are Christ's ambassadors. We are representing Christ. We are Christ's ambassadors and he wants us to accurately represent him to the world around us. Those outside of his kingdom. We're also to set an example to believers in our speech, our life, our love, our faith and our purity as told in Timothy. But we're to represent him to those who are outside, who don't know him yet. You see, that's a responsibility for each one of us because we're, we're being watched, aren't we? We're being watched by the world and people are forming their opinions about God and the gospel by what you say and by how you conduct yourself. So it's holy and a high calling. I don't know if you've ever been abroad on a holiday, but I know what it's like. You've been abroad on holiday in a nice quiet resort enjoying yourself. And then midweek, some of your fellow country people arrive and they're not so quiet. In fact, they're quite obnoxious and they're loud and they're noisy and they show no respect for the property and you're cringing. And what they're doing is exporting a very false image of their country. So we don't want to do that. We want to be examples worthy of Christ. See, Paul said, he said when talking to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 5, 9, he says, he told us that his one aspiration as an ambassador was this. He says, we're determined, whether at home or abroad, to gain the honour of being well-pleasing to him. We want to be well-pleasing to him wherever we are. Well-pleasing. So we represent Christ. That's what we're told. And we're to live a life worthy of the calling that we have received. That's what Paul said when talking to the Ephesians in chapter 4, verse 1. He said, Leave, lead, lead a life worthy of the divine calling to which you've been called, with behaviour that's a credit to your summons to God's service. Is our behaviour a credit to our summons to God's service? 
We're ambassadors for Christ. And in Colossians 1.8, Paul said this. He was praying for the Colossians. And he prayed that you may walk, live and conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him and desiring to please him in all things. We want to be fully pleasing to him and desiring to please him in all things. And remember, in whatever you do and say, we do it as representatives of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the Father through him. So, what have we got? An ambassador is a person who represents one country while living in another country. And we're citizens of heaven, and yet we're residents on earth. An ambassador is an authorized agent or representative of a sovereign. We get to be Christ's ambassadors here. Next, what else have we got? An ambassador has no right to manufacture his message. He simply communicates what's given him from headquarters. No right to manufacture his message. He simply communicates what's given to him from headquarters. Can you imagine an earthly ambassador for our country, say, deciding that he's been listening in to the parliament? Oh, he doesn't like that policy. And I don't like this one and I don't like that one. And I'm going to, to project, project my own propaganda. I'm going to forward my own agendas. It just wouldn't happen. It wouldn't happen. And the same for us. We're not here to make up our message or promote ourselves. As Paul says, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus. You see, an ambassador doesn't speak in his own authority. He doesn't air his opinions. Not at all. He simply says what he's been commissioned to say because he's in submission to a higher authority. You see, when the messenger becomes more important than the message, then you have the beginnings of a cult. And that's dangerous. It's the message that's all important that in it must be accurately transmitted and presented. So let's read this passage and apply it to ourselves tonight. It says, we are there for Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us, his appeal through us. When I was studying that during the week, I just thought, I thought it's amazing that sovereignty would stoop to this. Like God could have commanded all the angels and got the job done quickly. But he's trusted us, men and women, to run and be, make his appeal through us. Through us. And God's looking for men and women with a willing heart to serve him. And to let, to allow themselves to be his voice, his voice to their generation. That's what we need to be, willing vessels, his ambassadors. You see, God cares, he appeals to people to come to him, be reconciled to him. That's his heart. The Bible says that he desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth all men to be saved but are we doing our part or are we on the periphery running after other things you know the lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness but he's forbearing patient with us not wanting anyone to perish but all to come to repentance but he's making his appeal through us through us so we are there for Christ's ambassadors as the God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That's the message. Be reconciled to God. That's the gospel. He re be reconciled to God. He's given us what's called the ministry of reconciliation. And that Greek word for reconcile is katalasso. And it literally means to exchange or to reconcile. For in ancient Greek, it was used originally for the exchange of one coin for another, exchanging money. That's what it used to be. And then it was applied to people. And when it was applied to people, katalasso came to mean when two people are reconciled, they exchange enmity for friendship. 
enmity for friendship. And you can see how God wants us to be reconciled to himself. So we're to proclaim the fact that at infinite cost to himself, God has made a way of reconciliation possible. It's our duty, our privilege to tell others that they can be reconciled to God. You see, our sins have separated us from our God. But that's not the end. It says God demonstrated his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So there's a ministry, a service, in which the word of reconciliation is to be made known to others. They can be reconciled to God. If you're watching tonight and you don't know Jesus, you can be reconciled to God. He wants it. He's appealing through us be reconciled to him. So God's making his appeal through us. We're operating, according to this verse, on Christ's behalf. We don't do the reconciling. Christ is the reconciler. We're simply the agents, the voice, the one proclaiming the word. So I wonder if there's someone in your path that needs to be reconciled to God and needs you as an ambassador to come their way. Be reconciled to God. What else about an ambassador? I was thinking an ambassador must be in constant contact with the one who sends him. He must maintain constant contact with the one who sends him. You know, the earliest African converts to Christianity, they were earnest and they were fervent in their devotions. And apparently each one would have gone out into the thicket. They'd have gone to their own place in the grass and they had their own spot where they were fervent in prayer and in devotion to God. And through time you could see the tracks leading to each one's path. But also it became evident as someone slacked off in their devotions, the grass started to spring up again and you knew that they needed a little reminder. And someone would say to them, look, brother, the grass grows on your path yonder. A little reminder. But maybe we need that little reminder tonight. Does the grass grow on your path? Does your grass grow on your path? An ambassador cannot afford to allow the grass to grow on his path because he has to be in constant contact with the throne, constant contact with God himself. You see, he's learned to trust in the Lord with all his heart, to lean not on his own understanding. In all, in all his ways, he acknowledged him, acknowledges him, and he makes his path straight in all his ways. His paths are directed by God. His steps are ordered by God. He's listening for the voice of God and hearing what he's saying to him. He maintains that contact. You know, God says to us as well, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. But we have to be listening. God says, your ears will hear a word behind you. This is the way, walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right or the left, wherever you turn, it says in the Bible. But are we tuned in? We need to tune our ears so that we hear his voice and maintain that constant contact. It says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I know them and they follow me. So we need to maintain constant contact with the throne. And prayer is our lifeline. Prayer is our lifeline. And I wonder what the prayers of an ambassador sound like. As I was thinking that this week, I was thinking of what Jesus said when he was asked, Lord, teach us to pray. Remember he said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Isn't that the prayer of an ambassador? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. And how does he get up from that prayer? Thine is the kingdom, thine is the power. Thine is the glory. That's how we should be praying. So an ambassador is a person who represents one country while living in another country. We're citizens of heaven and residents on earth. An ambassador is an authorized agent of a sovereign. And we are Christ's ambassadors. An ambassador has no right to manufacture his message. He simply communicates what's given him 
from headquarters. And our message is be reconciled to God. Make your peace with God. And an ambassador must be in constant contact with the throne. And another one. An ambassador has all of his needs met by his home country. Isn't that beautiful? An ambassador has every need and every benefit provided because of his citizenship. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you as well. What were all those things? Well, if you put the text in context, they were worrying about what they'll eat and what they'll wear. Jesus says, look at the birds, I clothe them, look at the lilies of the field. The pagans run after all the things you're worrying about. And then he said this first, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. And to Paul, he also said to the Philippians, he said, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Think of that, my God. Who's your God? You know your God. He's well able to provide. My God shall supply all your needs. Not your greed, but your needs. According to his riches and glory, which are abundant, in Christ Jesus. The Bible says that when we trust God, we lack no beneficial thing. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack. It says, for 40 years you sustained them in the wilderness, and they lacked nothing. The Bible says, if you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who love him, who ask him? And my God is able to make all grace abound to you, said Paul, so that always having all sufficiency in all things, you may abound to every good work. That's a lot of alls. All sufficiency in all things. So an ambassador doesn't need to worry about how he's going to meet his needs because he's doing God's will and he's trusting God to provide for his every need that's met by his home country. And finally, I was thinking an ambassador flies a flag. At his embassy. An ambassador flies a flag at his embassy and as God's ambassadors we also have a banner and our banner says Jehovah Nissi. That's Hebrew for God is my banner. Jehovah is the covenant name for God, the self-existent great I am who was and is and is to come and Nissi means banner or ensign or standard or flag. So God is our banner, originated back in Exodus chapter 17 when it was Moses and the Malachites were fighting and this came about. The Lord is my banner. What's a banner? A banner was always brought out in times of war and it gave the soldiers a feeling of confidence and hope. And it was a focal point to remind everybody that who they were fighting for and that God was with them. So the Lord fights for us tonight. And I think someone needs to hear that. That's something really strong. The Lord fights for us. The Lord fights for us. You see, it says in Exodus 14, verse 13, Moses said unto the people, Fear you not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, and which he will show you today. For the Egyptians... Whom you see today, you shall see them no more forever. And then it says, the Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your pace. See, God's fighting for us. The Lord's our banner and he desires for each one of us to walk in victory. Second Chronicles 20 says, listen all of you in Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. And you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid or dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. 
It says you will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go against them for the Lord is with you. And remember Isaiah, he said this, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against them. We can say tonight, thanks be to God, who gives us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's given us this victory. We can have that flag, Jehovah Nissi, the Lord is our banner flying from our embassy. Thanks be unto be, be God, who always causes us to triumph in Christ. For remember, in all things, we're more than conquerors through him who loves us. We can rest under the protection of God and know that we are victorious in every storm and situation he brings us through. So let's remember tonight that we are ambassadors. Let's remember what that really means as we go about our week. An ambassador is a person who represents one country but is really a citizen of another. We are truly citizens of heaven while we're pilgrims and aliens and strangers and residents of the earth. An ambassador has, is an authorised agent or representative of a sovereign. And we get to be representatives of Christ, his personal representatives, ambassadors of Christ. An ambassador has no right to manufacture his own message. He simply communicates what's given to him from headquarters. And we, therefore, as Christ's ambassadors, are making our, his appeal. He's making his appeal through us. And we're saying, be reconciled to God. That's our message. An ambassador, he has to be in constant contact with the headquarters. So don't let the grass grow on your path. An ambassador is all his needs met by his home country. So you can seek first his kingdom. And don't worry about the other because everything else will be added to you. An ambassador flies a flag at his embassy and that flag is the Lord is my banner. So let's go out and be Christ's ambassadors. What a high and a holy calling. And I say again, if you don't know him tonight, be reconciled to God. Make your peace with God. In Jesus' name.